Hi, Lloyd Reber here to demonstrate a statistical analysis called the permutation test. This is an interesting way of determining if there is a statistical difference between two group means. So I'll do so with a very simple example. Imagine that we have a hospital that has come up with a, a new way to care for patients after they have a certain surgery. And they are wondering if that new post-operative care is better than their standard care. So what they do is they try to um, have some people who are going to be having this operation volunteer for the study. So they find seven people who are willing to volunteer. So this is very much a convenient sample. We have seven people who volunteer. So we do not randomly select from the population. This is just a convenient sample. And what we now need to do is take those seven people and randomly assign them to either the uh, control condition, which is going to be the standard care, or to the new condition, the new treatment. So how do we do that? How do we randomly assign? Well, let me use a time-honored tradition. I'm going to go ahead and use a baseball cap. Here is my Pittsburgh Pirate baseball cap, and I'm just going to put these people's names into my hat like so. I'm going to mix the hat, mix the names up in the hat. So I'm going to try my best to really mix things up here as best as I can. So we will then begin to pull from random three people for the control group. And then the remaining people, of course we only have seven, so only three can be in one and four can be in the other. So there's our treatment group over here. And so, yeah, very good. So now what we need to do is they have their surgery and we're going to give them their respective care. And we're going to see how long it takes them to recover. The people who are in the treatment condition, we find that person G takes 19 days, person E takes 22 days, person D 25, and person B 26. And now in the control, the, the, the regular or standard care, person F 23 days, person A 33 days, and then we have person C who takes 40 days. And now we go ahead and do a calculation. And we find that the treatment condition took on average less time for the people to uh, recover from the, from the operation, 23 days as compared to 32 days for the control. So if we take treatment minus the control, we have a difference of negative nine days. Now the question is, is this difference a significant difference or is it just due to chance? So how do we answer this question? What we're going to do is take these scores and ask ourselves, what's the likelihood of getting a difference of negative nine or actually an absolute value equal to or greater than nine if I take these scores and put them into my hat and I am going to again just take the scores now because those were the observed scores what's the likelihood that just that combination of the different actually permutations of those scores will give me a difference of negative nine and what percentage of the time that will actually happen. So I'm just going to take at random now these scores, kind of like reshuffling the deck. And I see we have these scores. Here we have a treatment group mean of 26.75 and a control group mean of 27 for a difference of negative 0.25. And so what I need to do is keep track of these differences. So I'll go ahead and bring these off to the side. So again, the very first time I did this, we had a difference of negative 9. And that was the observed scores of actually having done the experiment. Now, the first time I did this, as we saw, we had a difference of only negative 0.25. And I would keep doing this. I would keep putting the scores back into the hat 
and I would continue to shuffle these up and just continue to pull a distribution of scores that would have four in the treatment and three in the control and I would continue to do this computation to see what the difference in the means would be. And I could just keep going and going and going. So the question we have to ask is what proportion of these different scores is equal to or greater than the absolute value of nine? So if you do this little exercise over and over and over just keep reshuffling these uh, numbers and drawing them out at random, you will find that the proportion of those different scores is about 8.7%. Now that is a low proportion, but it does not meet our standard threshold of less than 5%. Therefore, we can conclude that there is no significant difference between the treatment and control groups. Okay, now that I've shown you what the permutation test is and how it works, let's consider the questions of why is this important or tell me why I should care. You might especially wonder why I'm showing this to you if you already know something about t-tests, given that we also use t-tests to compare the means of two groups to determine if they are significantly different. First, I hope you noticed that I was careful to point out in my demonstration that the hospital used a convenient sample consisting of the seven people who volunteered as compared to randomly selecting the participants from the population of all the patients who just had the surgery. This is a very typical and necessary compromise that researchers have to follow because people have the right not to participate in a study. But by following this procedure, the researchers are violating one of the important assumptions of a t-test, namely that the samples need to have been randomly selected from their populations. Yes, we randomly assign the seven people to the two groups, but it's important to remember the difference between random sampling and random assignment. So we would be criticized if we use the t-test for the hospital research example on the grounds that we have not met all of the assumptions of the test. On the other hand, the permutation test has no such assumptions to violate. Okay, if the permutation test is so great, why don't we use it instead of the t-test? Indeed, why don't we just throw away the t-test altogether? Well, given the power of modern day computers, others are asking the very same questions. The permutation test, you see, only becomes practical if you have access to high-speed computers. Back in the day, high-speed computing was a was available to just a few people, but that is obviously no longer the case. You need a computer to do the calculations, calculations that, although not at all complicated, are amazingly long and tedious to compute. Let me illustrate. The, the, the hospital example has only seven scores, four in the treatment group and three in the control group. In this example, there are only 35 permutations or unique groupings of these observed scores. And here you can see uh, groups of three because once you know three of the scores, you then can easily uh, derive the other four that would go with that particular group. But the number increases dramatically and very quickly when I have more scores. Here is the formula for determining the number of permutations from a given number of scores and the number of cases in one of the two groups. Now, as you can see here, n equals the total number of scores. In our case, that was seven, and r is the number of scores in one of the two groups. So we can enter three or four into this little equation. And in case you're not familiar with that exclamation point, it simply refers to the idea of factorial. So as you can see, three factorial would be simply three times two times one, four factorial, well you just multiply that by four, and again, four, three, two, one, and so on, five, six, seven, eight factorial, you just start with the number and you keep multiplying as you go down. So if we have more typical examples, such as an example of where we have uh, 30 scores and we want to have 15 in each of the two groups, here is the total number of permutations that this formula tells us we will have. 115,117,520. And if you wanted to separate the scores into three groups of 10, 
the number of permutations jumps to over 5.5 trillion. Not a great way to spend a few millennia if you were so inclined to compute these by hand. But fortunately, modern day computers can now do this for us with ease. Now, it also turns out that you don't actually have to figure out and use all those permutations. You can run something instead that's called the Monte Carlo version of the permutation test, a procedure that uses the picking from a hat method I just showed you. But even that procedure requires you to repeat the procedure a couple of thousand times in order to produce a close estimate of the actual proportion of scores that will equal or exceed the observed difference. So we still need a high-speed computer to run this procedure for us. Well, as it turns out, I just programmed such a tool in my spare time that will work for two groups at almost any number of scores. Let me show you how it works. Yes, here we have Lloyd's version of the permutation test of exact inference. And I built this little app to explore these ideas and also to have a way to demonstrate these ideas to others. Let me go ahead and begin. And here's the, the main screen here, very colorful. And let's just begin by seeing how this works. We start by entering the scores. And there we go. And now we need to enter the threshold. And we know all about that from the uh, earlier part of this video. Now a group size, we can enter either three or four. Three is better for computation. And how many times do I want to repeat this whole process? And how about if I put in 20? Okay, now I'm going to run this in what I'm calling demonstration mode, and you'll see what I mean in just a second. So let's see what that top hat is all about. All right, let's start. So what's going on here is it's taking the scores and putting them into the hat and shaking the hat, which is trying to symbolize randomizing the scores. It then takes the random numbers and puts them into the two groups. So again, at random, it takes out the numbers and puts, I think, the, the first three in the control group and the, and the remaining four in the treatment group. It then computes the means. It then computes the difference between the means, and then it puts that score, as you can see here, this difference score, over here in this difference list. So th that was a total of 20 loops or cycles or repetitions, and we had actually four of the scores that were above 9, and you can kind of see them right there. All right, so 4 out of 20 would be a percentage of 20%. So much higher than we saw in the video. Okay, well, let's do it again to see if it, if it uh, gives us the same result if we do it again. Okay, and I'm just going to go ahead and hit the Start button because I'm going to keep all of my basic choices the same. And let's see what we get. So again, it's just taking the numbers from the left and moving to the next column where it randomizes. It's then uh, putting the scores at random into group two, the control group, the remaining four will show up in treatment in the treatment group. It then computes the means. It then uh, takes the difference of those two means, the absolute value of those two means, and puts that difference score over here on the right-hand side. And we're just about at our 20 mark. Okay, so this time we had only two were at or above the thresholds. So this time it was a percentage. So with only 20 repetitions, you're going to have a lot of variation. Why don't we run this a lot more times? And this is why I have a fast mode, because this particular app that I built, it's pretty slow because it takes a lot of time to, you know, to jiggle the hat and put all the scores in here. I just wanted to do the computation as fast as, as I can. So for example, I'm going to go into fast mode and I'm going to just change the number of times it repeats to 100. And let's see how fast this goes. Okay, here we go. All right, so there's no f fancy graphics or anything going on, but you can see up here it's going much faster. And this time it actually found a total of 10 at or above the threshold. And I can scroll down through here. In fact, I can copy and paste these if I want to. But again, this is a nice app that's going to do as many as they want. How about if I make it run or have it run about 5,000 times? Yeah, so let's go ahead and put in 5,000. 
All right, let me go ahead and start this. And you can see there it goes. Now, I also built in the, um, the option to pause at any one point to see kind of how things are going. And then I can continue, okay? So it's really nice to be able to stop and start this and maybe just restart if I wanted to. Now you can see it's uh, going pretty fast, but uh, I'm not gonna make you wait the entire time in this video. I'll pause the video and then uh, come back when we actually get to the, to the 5,000 mark. Okay, well, we're getting near the end. Welcome back. As you can see, we're just about to 5,000. And there we go. All right. And again, all 5,000s of the uh, different scores are here. Now, what did we find? Well, there were 522 out of those 5,000 that were at or above the threshold for a percentage of 10.44%. So uh, what to make of that? Well, again, this particular example only has 35 different permutations. And so that it actually is not hard to compute how many, what would be the actual p-value or the, that percentage. And in a paper by Michael Ernst, the actual percentage is 8.57%. So you can see my little program is uh, uh, a little bit higher than that, actually quite a bit higher. I'm not exactly sure why. I think they're, well, one is using a randomization process, which I think is gonna have more, it's gonna have some error in it. And also I think the random number generator of this particular app is uh, also part of, the, part of the reason. But you can see, again, what is going on and exactly how this percentage, which is actually called the randomization p-value. But I think this is a fun little app to demonstrate how the permutation test works. And I had a lot of fun building it. So in conclusion, I think understanding the permutation test is a great way to really understand the fundamentals of determining the statistical significance of comparing the difference of means from different groups. It gets to the heart of what probability and significant tests are all about. The ideas are not that complicated, even though the contortions we have devised over the past 100 years or so to get around our inability to compute them except with paper and pencil are. We are living in a time where advances in computing technology have finally caught up with the ideas of nearly 100 years ago. Some have even gone so far as to suggest that we should abandon the teaching of analyses such as t-tests in introductory statistics courses in favor of methods such as the permutation tests. In a recent paper, George Cobb gives many good reasons for doing so, not the least of which is the fact that the famous English statistician, Sir Ronald Fisher, after whom the f-test used in the analysis of variance is named, said we should. Here is a quote from Fisher from 1936 as reported by Cobb. The statistician does not carry out this very simple and very tedious process, but his conclusions have no justification beyond the fact that they agree with those which could have been arrived at by this elementary method. So the permutation test is not just a curiosity or incidental historical footnote. It actually is based on a model that more accurately matches the reality of many of our research questions than other inference methods that are commonly taught, such as the t-test. The permutation test is really just a very direct or pure way of getting at what the term significantly different means. If we run all the possible permutations, we get an exact probability of how often the observed value will occur. And if this is not less than 5% of the time, then we typically conclude that the differences between the two groups are not statistically significant. And you know, the permutation test sure is a whole lot easier to understand than the t-test and the other tests of inference.